you got your Bible this morning, turn over to Psalm chapter 23. I just quoted a little bit for the offering and did not know that David was going to sing that song. It's neat how the Holy Spirit just orchestrates things beautifully. Psalm 23, we are um, talking about who Jesus is of late. I want to pick up on those same thought lines today. First of all, I want to say we're thrilled that you're here. Amen. Or we're thrilled that you're listening or watching because the Spirit of God is able to do so much in such a short amount of time that the power of God's Word is truly living and powerful, life transforming. Amen. So open your hearts this morning. Get ready to receive something from God that's going to just take your faith up to another level. Glory to God. Psalm 23, this is an old covenant scripture, and David uh, had a revelation of who the Lord is, and I love this revelation. He says, uh, Psalm 23, let's read it all. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff uh, comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love this psalm. My mother put it in the restroom of the upstairs of our house, and so I spent much time there. So I learned this psalm at an early age. <laughs> but the revelations in, contained within this one psalm are, are almost countless. And, um, but, but this morning we want to focus on the simplicity of who our shepherd is, who's leading us, who's guiding us. And I was thinking about, when you think of, of all the things that Jesus is, who He is. See, who He is to you will determine what you receive from the relationship. If He's just your ticket into heaven, then He'll help you to bypass hell and to make eternity uh, with Him, which is so wonderful, and it would be worth it all just for that. But Jesus is so much more. Even the word salvation that he brings is so much more than just entrance into heaven. It's preservation, wholeness, healing, deliverance. It, it, it's, it's prosperity. It's everything Jesus paid for when he shed his blood for us, when he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. When we traded our situation and our condition with his situation and his condition, when man trapped in sin was traded, come on, for a son of God, who is trapped in righteousness. Glory to God. And so when, you, when we, we think about all that Jesus accomplished when he raised from the dead, it now must change our perspective of how we see him. Because Jesus is much more than just my Savior in the sense of my eternal salvation. He truly is Lord of every area of life. He is my healer. He is my deliverer, amen? He is the one who sets me free. And this morning I want to focus on another aspect of who he is. And uh, I, I love what David said, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me, see. He guides me. So I want to show you uh, one aspect of this. I think that will be a blessing to you. Turn over to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke. I want to look at a couple situations that we see in the Gospel of Luke. And let's start in verse 18, Luke chapter 18. Mm, I'm glad you came today. You got your shouting shoes on today? I actually, I actually put mine back on. I was going to wear a different pair of shoes this morning. <laughs> they didn't feel right. I had to put my shouting shoes back on. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Sometimes he just gives you so much revelation that you just know, I can't, I can't think I can stay in my shoes this morning. Amen. So I woke up, I woke up last night. It was about 3.30, I think 3.37 in the morning. And he just started depositing into my heart, depositing into my heart. I thought, Lord, this is just too good. I don't know if I can even wait to preach it. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 18, and we'll start in verse 18. He said, Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. 
Now you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. And honor your father and mother. And Luke 18, verse 21. And he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. It's interesting when reading this passage that I believe a lot of people have missed the ultimate desire of Jesus' heart here. It's in what he said to him last. Come, follow me. His desire wasn't to get the rich man just to give away his possessions to feed the poor or help the poor. His interest was in this young man following him. But there was a reason why this young man couldn't follow him, and that's because he was attached to something else. Amen? He was attached to his possessions. He was attached to his own wealth. And I think in Matthew's account, he said uh, the, 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 the young man went away sorrowful knowing that he could not do it. Here in Luke's account, it said the young, that he just went away sorrowful. Uh, he went away sorrowful. Why? Because he knew in his heart, I, I can't, I can't, oh, can't do it. Can't give away my, my stuff. So Jesus said to his disciples then, he said, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. That surprised the disciples because there were many rich people following Jesus. And so they said, Master, how, how can this be? And Jesus said to them, hey, with God, all things are possible. God's not looking at the rich and rejecting them. It's the rich, many times, that put their trust in their own uncertain riches. And because they have their trust in themselves or their own ability, it's hard for them to let go and trust God with their even salvation, with the condition of their own spirit man. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount we call it, He gave what we call the Beatitudes. It's the pillars of the thinking of the kingdom of heaven. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. And He didn't say blessed are the poor in wallet. He said blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? Because if you're not poor in spirit, then you are looking at yourself as your, the ability to, to do everything in life, right? But the poor in spirit, the humble says, man, I'm in need of a Savior. Glory to God. So Jesus, come on, says to this rich man, come follow me. But he couldn't do it. Why? Because he was attached to something. He was enslaved to his own money. I love this song that we just sang, right? That David sang, uh, uh, come on, our chains are gone. We've been set free. We're no longer slaves of, of sin. We're no longer slaves of things from this world. Glory to God. Now turn back to Luke chapter 8. And we just see there that he makes reference of one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Luke chapter 8 and verse 1 and 2. It says, Now it came to pass afterwards that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And a certain woman, uh, Luke 8, 2, and a certain woman who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities or sicknesses. Uh, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. Woo! Right? And he went on to say, Joanna was there, uh, and then Susanna was there. These were ladies of wealth who followed him and provided for him with natural material things as, his, as he was preaching from place to place. And I love it because specifically uh, Luke names one of his closest followers who was really right there with the twelve was this lady Mary called Magdalene out of whom had come seven devils. And because she had seven devils in her, she had sicknesses and diseases that were attached to that, right? So, come on, she was probably addicted to multiple things, and she also had many sicknesses in her. Jesus set her free from that. Come on now, right? So the one in whom you serve, the one in whom you follow, the one in whom you're putting your eternal confidence in, that we will not live in hell, but we will live with him forever in heaven. This one whom we call Lord, this one in whom we call Savior, just so happens to be the one whom sets people free. And he is that to anyone who will let him be that to them. 
He never leaves us in the mess that he finds us in. Again, if we read Luke chapter 4, after Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan by uh, John the Baptist, and the Spirit of God came upon him in bodily form as a dove, and then a voice cried out from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. It says the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness there for 40 days and night where he did not eat, and he was tempted then by the devil who come to him and tempted him in three ways. Uh, the pride of life, come on, the pride uh, of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Who, who, and, and, and Jesus said to, the, to Satan in, in, in that wilderness, it is written, right? It is written, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And then coming out of the wilderness, it says in Luke chapter 4, he went down and takes the scroll from Isaiah 61 and he begins to read. And it's recorded in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. He said this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me. That word anointed means to cover, to saturate. For he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, the recovery of sight to the blind, and set at liberty those who are oppressed, the downcast, downtrodden part of society. And so I love this because two times in this short passage, Jesus points out, hey, Isaiah was talking about me, right. right? I am the anointed of the Lord. That anointing is on me. Here's what the anointing is for. I'm going to preach the good news to the poor, yeah. right? I'm going to heal the brokenhearted. Last week we talked about the healing of the brokenhearted. Amen, that Jesus is our deliverer. Hallelujah. But specifically this morning, I want to dig a little bit into the very next phrase. It says, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Come on. Uh, the, the Liberty to the captives. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. Because at one point in life, we've all been chained to something. We've all been bound to something. Right? Mary Magdalene was bound to evil. She was bound to addiction. She was bound to evil spirits, right? She'd opened her heart up to things. Maybe, uh, not even willingly. Maybe she was molested as a child. Maybe she had been through uh, much abuse from multiple... We don't have the background story, but all we know this is when Jesus found her, she's broken in every way. <laughs> but we know the end of the story that when he rose from the dead come on the angel of the Lord when they get to the tomb it was Mary Magdalene who was at the tomb looking for him because he said I'll raise again right come on the disciples are out fishing the disciples are nowhere to be found it was Mary and the angel of the Lord told her hey you go find the disciples tell them he's not here he's alive hey go find Peter and tell him praise God right she followed him closely. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the rich young ruler, right? He's rich. He's not like her. She's broken. She's a, abused. She's addicted. She's sick and infirm, maybe even not allowed to be around the general public. And, and, and so he's on the whole other end of the social economic scale, right? He's got much wealth. He's good looking. He's got his own reality TV show. He drives a Porsche. You know what I mean? He's got it going on. He's got an entourage of people around him at all times. Everybody wants to be him, right? If I was you, I'd want to be me too. I'd want to be me too. I'd want to be me too, right? That's for the younger bunch. The rest of you don't know what I'm talking about. And so, right? And so, and so, here he is on this end, but he just so happens to be bound himself. Right? To not something so ugly. To not something, you know, so repulsive. But he's bound to something that's going to keep him from following Jesus as well. But Jesus' heart was not to leave him trapped in his bondage either. Jesus said, hey, just go sell all your stuff that money away come follow me his heart wasn't to leave him in poverty come on you can't out give god 
There is a principle that Jesus understands, come on, that he was living himself. That if you will give, God will give back to you. Actually, he was introducing the rich young ruler to a level of wealth that he had not yet seen. Jesus, think about this. Come on, paid his taxes by causing a fish to pick up a coin, praise God. When he had 5,000 men plus women and children and they had no food, uh, they said, Master, should we take of the treasury and feed all these people? Come on, Jesus is walking around with so much wealth, he's got a treasure. 12 in full-time employees, right? And there's so much money in the treasury, the other 11 had no clue that Judas was skimming off the top. Right? And Jesus said, no, we don't want to take the money uh, of the ministry to do that. Uh, what do we have to work with? How many loaves do we have, right? They came and looked around. Man, one little boy's got five, five loaves and a couple fish. He said, that'll do. Come on. He started breaking and multiplying, giving the disciples to break and multiply. Come on. Jesus knew his father was his source and his provider. Come on. Wealth never had him. And it's amazing to me when you read Mark chapter 4 where it says the sower sows the word. Actually, it's the same story here in Luke chapter 8 that he shares right after uh, mentions of Mary Magdalene. That, that when the word of God is sown, it says that that word falls upon different soils of different hearts. And uh, one of the soils is it falls along the wayside where thorns come up and choke it out, you know. And another one falls on rocky ground. But, uh, uh, but, but, but it does say that there is a soil, come on, where the Word of God doesn't take root because of the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Come on, so there's multiple things in life that'll steal the word out of your heart, and it's not all on this end of the spectrum that looks nasty, woo, nasty and ugly. It's not all down here that looks demonic and evil. It's not all down here on the things that take place after midnight, right? Come on, there is part of this down here that starts at 6 a.m., full of pride, full of me, Full of me, look at me, I'm so good, I'm not like them, I work hard. If they worked hard, they wouldn't be like that, they'd be like me, chained <laughs> to something else. <laughs> right? Come on, this bunch down here is so afraid they'll never have anything. They're afraid they're going to repeat the sins of the past. They're afraid they're going to repeat the generational curse that they were born into. But this bunch down here has everything and they're afraid they're going to lose what they've got and end up like them. Come on, David said with his revelation, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm not my own shepherd. The Lord is my leader. He's my guide. He leads me beside still waters. Come on. He puts me in green pastures. I love what David goes on to say, though, right? He said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Glory to God. Come on, this group must get a revelation that they are not their own shepherd. Come on, the Lord is my shepherd. Why? Because even when you're in this group, there is a Fear that tries to come from the enemy to tell you, you might be okay now, but you will lose everything you got. Baby, I've seen it a hundred times. I've sat in counseling sessions with people that make ten times what I make. Afraid. Full of fear. Tormented. I had one guy really cracked me up in the middle of that, that trial we went through. I shared a little bit last week about our testimony, the Lord delivered us from that mess. So it was about that time period, back in 2008. And man, we were just dealing with all kinds of economic crises, man, just big time stuff. And I had this guy, he called, he said, I just need to meet Pastor. I'm going crazy, you know, my financial trouble. And so I met with him and we sit down and I said, well, just lay it out for me. Just how much do you owe? What is it? He said, it's just my credit card. He said, I've never had credit card debt. And man, it's out of control. And I said, how much do you owe? He said, I owe, he's got like tears in his eyes. I owe $3,200. Man, I about fell under the table laughing. <laughs> I mean, I owed like 120 grand, you know what I mean? Like, I'm fighting for my life. I mean, I'm juggling everything I can do to make sure, right? I'm like, 32? I said, you mean on one card? He said, no, that's all of them. I'm like, are you kidding me? Come on, right? What was wrong? He does not have a revelation that the Lord is his shepherd, right? Come on, he was walking in fear over something so minuscule. 
Now, I'm not, not saying $3,200 isn't substantial at some point, but trust me, if, hey, listen, if that's all you're dealing with, I'll trade with you any day. Praise the Lord. <laughs> right? Come on now. But Jesus, when he found anybody in any situation, no matter where they were on the socioeconomic scale of life, he was looking to set them free so that what? Watch this. They could follow him. It was a condition of their heart. So now let's jump over to Romans chapter 6, and I believe we'll understand what Paul's saying here in such a better light now. Romans chapter 6. The, the epistles shed light upon what Jesus did. It's the writings of Paul, James, Peter, John that, that give us insight. James Stalker said, come on, it's like an x-ray. We could say an MRI. It's an internal look on the inside of man's condition, what Jesus did for us when he raised from the dead. We're not only sons of God going to heaven. Come on, but Jesus has become to us all that he is. Romans chapter 6. Now this particular verse is uh, very important to me because in, in, in a short season of my life, when I become addicted to some things, um, 19 years old, just, just turning 20, man, the Lord set me free. And the way the Lord set me free was from this passage in Romans chapter 6. So I drill this passage into the hearts of the young adults and into the hearts of the youth because it helped me. Amen? I believe it'll help you. But I love Romans chapter 6 because it says, let's just pick up, oh, in verse 7. It says, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe uh, that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Now, the context of what he's saying, he already said in Romans 6, and that is, when Jesus died, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. But when he rose, we were raised with him. He's not talking about your physical life. He's talking about your spirit man. The Apostle Paul said this in Galatians chapter 2, same writer, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He said, I was crucified with Christ. Now, it's amazing, isn't it? Because he wasn't around when Christ was crucified. Or if he was, he was on part of the crucifying bunch. <laughs> right? Because he was also a Jew, a teacher of the law. And so, but he said, I was crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ living in me. And the life that I now live in this flesh, I live by my faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? So Paul had an understanding of the depth of what Jesus did when he was, was, was crucified, when he was buried and when he raised from the dead. And that was, he did it not only for us, come on, but he placed us inside of himself. Go read it. He didn't go to the cross for himself. He went to the cross for me. Come on, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Ooh. Mm. Right? So Romans chapter 6, he goes on to say, verse 11. This is where we know, come on, that, that the Lord and the disciples, they spent some time in this region of Kentucky. Because they said, likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead. Amen? I reckon I am. You reckon? Yeah, right? Likewise, he says, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in its lust. Isn't that amazing? If you let it reign you end up obeying it. It's leading you. Right? The rich young ruler wanted to follow Jesus, but he couldn't. Why? Something else was leading him. He said, do not, that's why I love this, this verse 13, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Come on, Mary Magdalene vexed with seven demons. I can't imagine the sin. She could have made her home on Bourbon Street and nobody would have minded, right? Fit right in. 
But come on, this same woman who was dominated by evil once received the freedom of Jesus. She dominated it. Come on now. It once dominated her, but now she's following him. And she's dominating sin. Not only is she dominating sin, where it has no hold on her any longer, she's also trumpeting to all that will listen how good Jesus is. He set me free. Amen? Come on, he says, for you're not under the law, but you're under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. I love this verse. Come on, shall we sin? Because we're not under the law anymore? Because we're not under the law given unto Moses any longer? Because we've been set free? Because when Jesus rose, he fulfilled the law, every jot and tittle of it. He wiped out the handwriting of requirement that was against us, and we're now living under grace. We're now living under free uh, flow of mercy from heaven. Come on, we're now living under the abundance of the Spirit of God who looks at us through the blood of Jesus. That the sacrifice was perfect, right? He's no longer judging us in our sin. So since we're living under grace we should go ahead and sin so that no he said certainly not i laugh at my friends i've got good friends that are so excited about the grace of our lord jesus christ that they picked up alcohol again they're like man i am free i can drink now i'm living under grace and to that, come on, I don't laugh at them in a sense of uh, ridicule, but I laugh at the thought that, come on, Jesus sets you free from every tie to this world, and because of that freedom, you want to re-enslave yourself to something He sets you free from. Come on now, I'm not preaching against alcohol. Jesus turned water into wine to make the wedding better. So it's fine if you want to drink alcohol. He said, don't be drunk. with. I just found out something. You can't get drunk if you don't drink. <laughs> it's really amazing, you know? <laughs> It really is, I mean, and I'm really honestly just thankful that I never developed a taste for that. My grandfather was an alcoholic, and because of that, he was an abuser, and um, he didn't abuse alcohol, he abused people because of the alcohol abuse. So people that abuse alcohol don't really bother me, it's people that abuse other people because of the alcohol that kind of bothers me. And I really believe if I wasn't even a believer in Jesus that I wouldn't drink just because of the evil that I watched torment my family because of what alcohol did. Well, that went over really well. <laughs> Amen. Right? So I'm not picking on drinking. If you like to have a beer when you mow the grass, go for it, man, honestly. I mean, really, it won't bother me at all. I'm really not even that worried about you offending your brother, you know? I mean, but the Bible does tell us not to. So I think it's fun, though. I like to hang out with sinners. I mean, I really do. And I'm really be honest with you, I'm probably hang out with them about as much as I do all you wonderful believers, you know? and um, Jesus was the friend of sinners. So one of my very favorite weddings that we did, I did a wedding um, for a, a couple that came into the church, and they were like Mary Magdalene. I'm talking vexed with everything. I mean, I'm a mess, man. And so I had to go to the house and, and meet there, and police officers involved, and screamings, and shoutings, and addictions, and all kinds of stuff. It was wild. And, uh, but they kept coming. We kept putting the Word of God in their heart. Man, they both gave their life to Jesus. It was beautiful. And so I, I didn't tell them. They were living together, which most of society is, you know. And so, um, and so they were living together. And so I didn't tell them. I didn't say a word to them about, about living together. I just preached the word of God to them, the goodness of God, and shared the love with them. But they got their heart in tune with the Spirit of God. And they come to me and said, Pastor, we, we think we ought not to live together. We need to get married. And so I said, well, you know, if, if it's... If it's uh, don't get married just because you don't want to live in sin. You get married because you want to spend the rest of your life with each other, pursuing the same purpose, right? So we had, and they seemed like they really had their head on straight on this. So I said, yeah, I'd love to do the wedding, you know? So we did the wedding here. And uh, the, the, the wedding rehearsal night, we come, you know, and rehearse the wedding, practice the wedding. And then they said, we're going to Applebee's for the rehearsal dinner. And so I said, well, let me turn the lights and everything off. I'll meet y'all over there going over. So they all, wedding party went on over there. And I met them uh, 10, 15 minutes later. And I sat down. And when I walk up, everybody's got one of them big tall beers. You know what I mean? And this was the coolest thing for me. Honestly, this was a, this was a really, uh, made an Im impact in my, in my heart and in my mind. I'll never forget it. And so when I sit down in the booth with them, uh, the groom said to me, Pastor, you want a beer? 
Now, that might seem trivial to you, you know, but I realized something. Come on, God had done something in my heart to where now I can be the friend of sinners. Come on, to before, those people didn't like me very much. Right? And, yeah. And so it's really cool because I just finally said, you know, no, I'm not going to have one tonight. Thanks. <laughs> and that's all I said. But what I loved about that was he was genuine and as sincere as anything. Why? Come on, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was enslaving him. It was just something, come on, that they did on a social casual. Level. No big deal to me. I actually thought about having one that night. I thought, wow. Then it went away real fast. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been funny if I'd have spit it up all over, like, you know. What's my point? Come on, people are just bound to all kinds of stuff. Bound to all kinds of stuff. And then fall in love with the thing that they're bound to. Come on, but look what he says. Shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but now we're under grace? Certainly not. Verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Ooh, come on, somebody. You just traded who you were attached to. Right? Come on, I was attached, enslaved, tied to some things, right? But Jesus came and set me free, cut those chains. My chains are gone. I'm no longer bound to these things, keeping me, watch this, from following him. And now I have reattached to him. And now David had a revelation of this and said, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me and he guides me. Come on, into paths of righteousness. Glory to God. It's amazing who you're slave to. See, this terminology, uh, you know, you're a little bit familiar with this even in the technology realm. When we bought a digital soundboard, we found out we could actually buy a second one and use it, but it would be a slave to the first. Right? And the CD duplicator machine that we've got back there, we've got a master drive, and then we've got six slave drives. And if we want to, we can get a second machine, and we can enslave it to the same master drive. Right? Come on. To, to enslave something to the master means that whatever the master decides, the rest of them are going to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's amazing when you're a slave of sin, that, watch this now, that sin just drags you around and it leads you into all kinds of stuff, right? Now, I'm not just talking about these old dark, dirty sins over here. <laughs> I'm talking about whatever we're enslaved to, right? I found in my life, come on, I wanted stuff before I could afford to have the stuff. So I become enslaved to it. You say, I'm not a slave to that. Man, I have to pay it every month. I'm a slave to it, right? I mean, the Bible says that, but I didn't read the Bible when I wanted to buy it, <laughs> right? The Bible says no man anything but to love him, right? And I said, well, that don't apply to the mortgage on the house, surely, right? So what happens? Man, I'm telling you, that thing comes out of my account whether I want it to or not. So that means I'm a slave to it. I have to get up and go to work to make sure there's money in that account to pay that thing that's coming out of that. Oh, it's never fun. Brother Hagin said, if you want to make a crowd quiet, just preach on sex, money, or marriage. And I tell you, it gets quiet every time. <laughs> we already talked about money. Let's talk about sex. Now let's... No. <laughs> what did pastor preach about this morning? He talked about being a sex slave. <laughs> so... <laughs> Come
Come on, when you're attached to something, when you're enslaved to something, it just drags you around. Come on, bumping you off of everything, hitting telephone poles, right? Hitting the side of the rock base. And it's just, my, when I drive my, my truck and I put the trailer behind, I've got a 16-foot double axle trailer that just does all kinds of interesting things. We could have a reality show just with my, we could call it my 16-foot double axle trailer. It's amazing. what you, you just wouldn't believe the things that that trailer hauls and does. It's awesome. People call you, Pastor, you ain't doing nothing Tuesday. You could bring the trailer with you. Yeah, like I'm not doing nothing Tuesday. (laughs) (laughs) But when I attach that trailer to my truck, that trailer is now enslaved to the truck. Where the truck takes it, it goes. Right? Come on now, when sin's got a hold of you, and it just takes you and bounces you off, I love the revelation of what Paul says here. We are free from that slavery. We have now become slaves of righteousness. That these instruments that were once tremendously gifted at sin, whoa, right? The instrument of our voice. I'm telling you, I've got, I've got relatives and friends that they cuss in such a way, it's so wonderfully creative. They put words together that I thought, man, is amazing. It took them years to learn, to, to, right? <laughs> the stuff that comes out of people's mouth, right? Come on, your tongue is not a slave to sin. These hands are not a slave to sin. The same hands I praise God with are not the hands that are to be instruments of unrighteousness. I love what he says. Come on. They were once slaves of sin, but now they've been set free. They're now instruments of righteousness. Ooh, glory to God. Now watch the difference. He said we are no longer slaves of sin. We have now become slaves of righteousness. That's an interesting term. I thought I was set free. I'm not slaved to anything. Oh, come on. You want to be a slave of righteousness. Because when you hitch your wagon to righteousness, glory to God, (laughs) it's going to take you some places. Right? Righteousness will take you some places. What's that mean, righteousness? That's a Christian word. What is that? Righteousness simply means right standing with God. That there's nothing separating you from the love of your Father. I think Paul explained it best in Romans chapter 8, two chapters later, when he said nothing in this world or nothing in the world to come, nothing in the physical realm or nothing in the spiritual realm, nothing shall separate me from the love of God. That's what it means to be a slave of righteousness. I am so in right standing with God that there's nothing that can come between me and God. I'm not only enslaved, but I'm not even on a long rope. I am a directly attached. That 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says that I am one spirit with the Lord. Come on, that my spirit is so attached to His spirit that now I am enslaved. And it's not the, uh, the terminology of a negative slavery. It's the terminology of the fact that I am a attached to the master Ooh, come on when you're attached to the master wherever he leads i follow and david had a revelation of this come on 1200 years before jesus even set foot on the earth as a man david had a revelation that it's the lord that is my master He leads me and guides me into paths of righteousness Come on, if a billionaire wanted me to be enslaved to them for just a little while, I sure wouldn't mind it, right? Come on, just follow me, they say. I'm just going to bounce you around off of a little bit of wealth. Praise God, hallelujah. Here's about a million, go do that right there. Come on, here's a million, go pay the buildings off, go build another building. How about another million, would you like that? Come on, just to treat your family good. I'd say, just bounce me around, baby, praise the Lord. Right? Not a slave in a sense of obedience to their, their wishes. I'm talking about, come on, Jesus is our master and has freed us from the things of this world. Amen. He has, come on, allowed us to hook up our cart to his horse. To now he can lead us and guide us into paths of what? Righteousness. So he said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the things that you've desired with your natural eye, 
shall be given unto you. Ooh, come on. All this stuff you want, he already talked about it. The clothes you want to wear, the food you want to eat, all the things that you think are so important. He said, come on, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. When you become a slave of righteousness, come on, you're a slave of freedom. It almost sounds like an oxymoron, right? I'm a slave of freedom? Really? What's that mean? That means everywhere you're drug around, you're just free, 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 and more free. The Lord leads you into freedom. He guides you into freedom. He keeps you in freedom. When the enemy comes and tries to reattach you to slavery, the Lord says, come on, we're moving out of this pasture. We're moving right over here to this pasture. Glory to God. He keeps you, come on, hooked to the master. And you end up free. You stay free. You don't have to worry about the fear of losing what the Lord has blessed you with. You don't have to worry about that thing coming back on your body that you got healed from. Even though the Lord healed you. Come on, the doctor said in 10 years it's coming back and it's been nine years and you're starting to think about it. Your brain's starting to go, hmm, I wonder if I need to, I wonder about, I haven't really thought about that, but now, now fear is starting to come back in you. Why? Because the enemy wants you to think that that was a temporary freedom. But it can't be because of who Jesus is. Jesus is my freedom. He's my freedom from this world and all of its lust. He's my freedom from this world and all of its infirmities. He's my freedom from every demonic attack and every evil thing. He's my freedom. I'm no longer a slave to the things of this world, but now I'm a slave only under the righteousness of God. Come on, when you become a slave under righteousness, watch this. He leads you into your purpose. Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1, Lord, open their eyes that they may see. Open the eyes of their understanding. Let them have a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you that they might know, number one, the hope of their calling. Number two, the inheritance that they have as saints. And number three, the greatness of your power that raised Christ from the dead. Ooh, come on, when we become slaves of righteousness, the revelation of our calling becomes clear. That he leads us. I don't want to use the term drags us because he doesn't do it forcibly because you are, watch this, voluntarily connected. Amen. One way of saying to understand grace is this. Faith is our grip on God and grace is his grip on us. Right? So as long as we won't let go of God. He can't let go of us. And now he won't. He can't. It's only up to man to let go of that relationship. Right? So if by faith you let go, come on, he, he'll willingly let you because he'll allow everything. He loves us. If we'll hold on, trust him, he'll never let us go. And he'll lead us gently in the paths of righteousness and say, here's what I created you for. Oh, come on, think about Mary. You think she was not only relieved, but think of the joy in her heart when she found out she had a purpose. When her whole life she lived under a shadow, a, a blanket, a cloud of self-worthlessness, a cloud of insufficiency, a cloud of brokenness from the abuse of her life. Right? Thinking of herself so low, that she identified with that mess. Think about the joy in her heart when she found out, not only did he free me from the physical ailments and free me from the spiritual bond, but he set me so free that he led me into my very purpose to be a follower of Christ. Ooh, glory to God. Come on, to be a slave of righteousness, you start finding out what you were created to do. Your purpose becomes clear. You start talking to your Father God because now you're so attached, you're confident in your prayers that you're not just praying, hoping somebody hears you, but now you begin to discover, I'm directly attached to the Creator of heaven and earth and He's my Father. And His eye is on me and His ear is open to me. And when I pray, He hears me and He starts to reveal to you, this is why I made you in the first place. Glory to God.